Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your host tonight as we trek along Europe's most epic pilgrimage, the Camino de Santiago, along with a very special guest. Before we get to the Camino, though, I actually want to start out on a different long distance hiking trail in Europe for just a couple minutes. I want to go to Mont Blanc because I want to let Rick introduce us to tonight's guest. So we're just going to take a couple minutes in Mont Blanc before introducing tonight's guest and moving along to the Camino de Santiago. So off we go. The Tour de Mont Blanc is part in wooded farmland and part above the tree line in the company of glaciers. The appealing thing about it for American hikers is the delightful mix of nature, history, and culture. The people you meet on the trails come from many lands, and your days are filled with cheery greetings. We're in France for this section, so it's bonjour. Hikers here have plenty of options. You can hike as little or as much of the route as you like, but you must reserve your beds well in advance. One thing I really appreciate, you can hire a transfer service to take your luggage to the next hut. That frees me up to hike with just the essentials in a small day bag. And with Cassandra's help, I've chosen a route I'm comfortable with. A typical day on the trail is about 10 miles and around six hours of walking, and the route is never dull. This bridge actually dates back to Roman times, and for much longer than that, its river has been carving this gorge. So one of the really interesting parts about this route is that it used to be an old Roman road, and there was a Celtic settlement just down the way. So in addition to Romans and Celts, these paths were also used by shepherds taking their stock to different fields. Mountain huts called refuges are placed conveniently a day's hike apart. Our first night is at Nant Buran, a mountain lodge dating back to the 1800s. All right. Well, I am pleased to report that Cassandra Overby is not in a remote mountain lodge on the slopes of the French Alps. Instead, she is here at Rick Steves Europe HQ, um, joining us to discuss the Camino de Santiago. So it is my distinct privilege to introduce travel guide, author, and hiker extraordinaire, Cassandra Overby. Cassandra, welcome to Monday Night Travel. How are you tonight? I am great. I am so happy to be here. I love talking about hiking-based travel. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and I think we're in for a really great show. So I think so as well. And before we embark on the Camino, Cassandra, I'm, I would like to know two things. I want to know, how did you connect with Rick? Um, and how did long distance hiking in Europe become a passion and area of expertise for you? Sure. Okay. Let me share here. So Rick got in touch with me after he read my flagship book, Explore Europe on Foot. And he and I are kind of kindred spirits. <clears throat> we have a very similar approach to travel. So we want you to go into a spot where there are not a lot of other tourists, right? Small villages, places where you can really be a local, find out about local history, find out about local culture. Um, and he really gelled with one of my other approaches, which is that anyone can do hiking-based travel. You don't have to be an athlete. This is really for everyone, it's walking. So he asked me to come on his radio show and we recorded a couple segments all about walking-based travel. And then ultimately he asked me to be his mountain guide on Tour de Mont Blanc, which was amazing. But you're probably asking, you know, how did I get to be Rick Steve's mountain guide? Cause that's a pretty cool job. And Honestly, you know, if you had asked me back when I started with hiking based travel, if I thought that would be me someday, I would have said no. I actually stumbled on hiking based travel as a thing. So it started a few years ago. My now husband, Mac, asked me to join him on his big dream trip, which was a months long trip of Europe, grand tour. He had never really traveled. And so he invited me along. And because we were going to be doing long term travel, we really wanted to pace ourselves. We didn't wanna burn out with all the sightseeing right away. So we decided to take breaks. 
And we took breaks in my very favorite way, which was taking hikes. So I've always been a hiker and a walker. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, and pretty soon we started doing longer hikes and longer hikes and longer hikes. And really we never expected that they would become the very best part of our trip, but they really did. So what was it that really got us? To start with, the scenery that we were walking through, the landscapes were amazing. <clears throat> These are the kind of places that you dream about, the Swiss Alps, um, the beauty of the mountains, these beautiful streams and lakes up there, the mountain wildflowers. But it wasn't just that, it was also the villages that we passed through. So the trail wound through a series of villages, every trail that we went through, that were quaint and that were just gorgeous. We had amazing comfort food all along the way. That's one of the very best things about hiking in Europe is actually that they have so many huts and restaurants where you can stop that you don't have to pack a lot of food with you. And the food that you do get is really incredible. But it wasn't just that. We also got to see really amazing history. And it wasn't something that we intentionally had to find our way to. It was history that we actually walked right past. So like these ancient Roman ruins. This is stuff that we never would have found had we been traveling in a different way. So one of my other very favorite things that we always stumbled across was local village celebrations. So at this Oktoberfest celebration, it was in a tiny little village where there were no other travelers. And we simply got invited because the people we were staying with that night said, hey, come along to our little talent show. And it was amazing. So it became clear and it didn't take very long for me to see that actually hiking wasn't really a break from our travel, it was a better form of travel. And that really shifted how we did our trip and how I've done every trip since. And it was a game changer for me. So when I headed home, I started um, Explore on Foot, which is a travel company that's all based around hiking-based travel and making it accessible for people. Because when I was starting out, trying to learn about the trails of Europe and how to do hiking-based travel, it was a little tricky to find all the information. So to start with, I wrote a giant guidebook all about it. I call it the Bible of hiking in Europe. And it's all about how to pack, how to prepare, where to go. Anything that you could ever want to know about hiking-based travel in Europe is in that book. And I also wrote three guidebooks for specific trails that are mentioned in my big book. So if you want to go and you want to have um, walking directions and you want to have GPX tracks and really know every mile of the trail, you can have that. But even with all of that hiking in Europe and all that experience, the Camino, which I'm really excited to talk about tonight, stands out. It's a phenomenal trail. Part of it is that a pilgrimage is such an amazing way to just unplug, stop focusing on all that stuff that doesn't matter and start really focusing on the stuff that does matter. You can meet friends from all over the world. <clears throat> And one of the best things too, is that this truly is a way to be part of something that's bigger than yourself. Oh, well, Cass, you have me sufficiently excited uh, for the Camino. And I just want to remind people that um, if you want to check out Cass's book, um, Europe on Foot, Explore Europe on Foot, or um, the individual guidebooks, we've linked to those in the chat widget. Um, and we've also linked to that radio interview that you mentioned. So if you want to learn more, there are resources in the chat. Um, but I'm excited to embark on the Camino now. Um, it is definitely something I would like to do someday. So I'm eager to learn more. Um, for today's presentation, we are going to be following along um, the French way. But Cass is also going to talk to us a little bit about other ways that you can explore the Camino too. So, but let's embark now starting in southwestern France um, and begin our journey together. Put on your virtual hiking boots. We're going to Santiago de Compostela. The Camino de Santiago, literally the way of St. James, is Europe's ultimate pilgrimage route. Since the Middle Ages, pilgrims have walked hundreds of miles across North Spain to pay homage to the remains of St. James in the city named for him, Santiago de Compostela. In our generation, the route's been rediscovered, and more and more pilgrims are traveling this ancient pathway. During medieval times, Spain became an important pilgrimage destination. Pilgrims from all over Europe journeyed to Santiago de Compostela in the northwest of Spain. We'll join the main route, starting in the Pyrenees at San Jean Pied de Port, stopping at Pamplona, Burgos, Lyon, 
and on through the region of Galicia to Santiago. So, Cass, I'm wondering, when, when we say the Camino de Santiago, is that this one route? Um, are there different routes? How should people decide which route they should embark on? Right, so that's a great question. Um, here it is. Let me show you this map. So one of the common misconceptions about the Camino is that it's one route. And actually, it's a whole network of routes. But in the true spirit of the pilgrimage, it used to be that people would just walk out their front door and start walking all the way to the cathedral at the very end. But over time, those routes kind of coalesced into main routes that people started to join in on. And those became the major routes that we have today. So even though you could walk from Russia or Norway or Germany, the, the number one most popular route is the French way. And the French way is 31 days of walking. And that's if you don't take rest days, which I really recommend that you do. Um, and that's walking 12 to 18 miles a day, but you definitely don't need to walk that long. So the second most popular route is the Portuguese way. And that route's 25 days of walking um, without rest days. And that starts down in Lisbon, walks up through Spain, um, I'm sorry, through Portugal into Spain. But there are some other routes as well for if you wanna have a little sampler platter or do a little shorter trip. So one of those is the primitive way and that's in yellow right here. That's 14 days. It's the oldest Camino that there is. And it's also a World Heritage Site as of 2015. Um, and then one of my favorite routes, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is the English Way. And that's over in orange, kind of on the top left of the screen. And that route takes off from northern Spain in the spot where the British pilgrims used to disembark from their ships and goes down to the cathedral. So. The main thing is that all of the routes end at the cathedral in Santiago de Compostela. And to get your Compostela, your certificate that you've done the walk, you only need to walk the last 100 kilometers. So that's why you can do a shorter walk and still have it be an official pilgrimage and official Camino. Now, another cool option that I really like to recommend is the walk to Finisterre. So Finisterre is a four day walk from Santiago de Compostela and a lot of people do it after they finish the route and you go to the end of the world. So it's a cape where you can look out, all you see is water and it feels like a little more final ending to your walk. And it's a really fitting tribute to your pilgrimage. Well, that's so, that's so fascinating to me. I actually studied in Oviedo and I would always see the golden shells on the ground there. So I knew that one of the routes passed through, but I didn't know it was the starting point of the, uh, the primitive route, the oldest one. Um, so, oh, now I, I feel like I want to do that one someday. Go visit my Spanish mama and then just go for a casual, go walk, casual <laughs> walk to Santiago de Compostela. Um, and good to know that it can count as a, an official pilgrimage without spending the full five weeks. Right. Um, all right. So with that, we are going to continue along on the French way. Um, but it is good to know that those other options exist. But let's continue on now. While dedicating a month of your life to walk the Camino may be admirable, it doesn't work for everyone. But any traveler can use this route as a sightseeing spine and as an opportunity to appreciate some of the joys and lessons that come with being a pilgrim. Just five miles before the Spanish border stands the French Basque town of saint jean pied de port Traditionally, Santiago-bound pilgrims would gather here to cross the Pyrenees and continue their march through Spain. Visitors to this popular town are a mix of tourists and pilgrims. At the Camino office, pilgrims check in before their long journey to Santiago. They pick up a kind of pilgrim's passport. They'll get it stamped at each stop to prove they walked the whole way and earned their Compostela certificate. So, uh, Cass, first, just to clarify, you can, you can get these passports even if you're not doing the French way. You can get them on the other routes. That's right. The most important thing to remember is that you really want to get your Compostela stamped where you start. Um, and then from there, you get it stamped, you get it stamped at albergues, at restaurants, bars, all sorts of places along the way. Um, you want to get at least three or four stamps every day to really document that you did walk and that you didn't take public transportation. 
and important to document all those bars that you stopped at, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems to me that the Camino de Santiago has so much kind of pomp and circumstance to it with all of these passports and um, just kind of special accessories. You see people wearing the shells. Is that something right. that's unique to the Camino de Santiago or do other long distance hikes in Europe do similar things? So there are other pilgrimage routes in Europe that do similar things and that have Compostela's like that and that, you know, you get your passport stamped. But actually, there's not very much pomp and circumstance on hiking trails in Europe in general outside of pilgrimages. So as opposed to the U.S., you know, you're not going to find a lot of passes, even in national parks. You're not going to need permits for hikes or worry about, you know, exceeding capacity or different things like that. So it's actually hiking in Europe is a lot easier than hiking in some of the spots that we have here. Yeah, Less I know. Deep. In Washington state where, where oh, we yeah. live, a lot of times it's like, you need to be planning six months in advance if you want right. to do a hike in certain parts of the state. Yeah. Um, very interesting. All right, well, let's continue on now that we have our passport. Walking the entire 500 mile long route takes about five weeks. That's about 15 miles a day with an occasional day of rest. The route is well marked with yellow arrows and scallop shells. The scallop shell is the symbol of both St. James and the Camino. Common on the Galician coast, the shells were worn by medieval pilgrims as a badge of honor to prove they made it. The traditional gear has barely changed. A gourd for drinking water, just the right walking stick, and a scallop shell dangling from each backpack. Cass, did Rick said a gourd. Did you did you carry a gourd? Do people carry actual gourds? So I carry the modern equivalent of a gourd, which is actually a platypus that's dedicated just to wine. And of course, I have my platypus that has water in it because you need to be properly hydrated. But this really is the way to hike. And Roman soldiers were actually the first to hike with wine. So I said, well, I actually, you poured me a little glass <laughs> from your platypus. I didn't know that you called it that until just now. Yeah. Um, but I have a little bit of platypus wine here. So Cass, I just want to say cheers to you. As cheers. We on the journey, cheers to all of you at home. Um, and I'm wondering, Cass, beyond your trusty wine platypus, um, what else do you pack for a long distance hike in Europe? How do you approach that? Yeah, I love talking about planning and packing. <laughs> so let me bring this up. Okay, so you don't have to be an athlete to do this kind of travel. I said that before and I really, really mean it. But you will have the very best time if you put a little effort into your physical training. So, you know, you want to make sure you really just get your body used to walking. There are a lot of stresses because of a heavy backpack, because of walking for multiple days in a row that you otherwise might not think of. Um, so like your hip flexors can be really tight because you lean forward because you have a heavy pack on. So that's stuff that you can prepare for when you train in advance. So in my book, I talk a lot about a general training plan to get you trail fit. But the main thing that I really like to recommend too is make sure that you simulate your walk as much as possible. So you don't just want to work up to walking for multiple days in a row, but you really want to train in your shoes. You want to train in the clothes that you're wearing on trail. You want to train in your backpack and make sure that everything gels. That's one of the very best things that you can do to prepare for a long distance hike, something that I do every time that I walk. Um, another thing that I really like to recommend to people is that as far as packing goes, pack light. You will be carrying all of your stuff on your back likely. It's not common to do luggage transport on the Camino. So that means that everything you bring, you will feel on your back. So make it light. I like to pack with less than 20 pounds on my back. Um, I'm kind of famous for my packing system, which is one trail outfit, one town outfit. You do a lot of laundry by hand each night but you don't need much beyond that. You're covered for everything. So to make that work, I really recommend that you pack with a lot of merino wool because it resists odors, it's quick drying, and then also pack in a neutral color palette where everything goes with everything and then you really can't go wrong. So I wanna call out some specific things that are really important um, for the Camino and for other long distance hikes in Europe. 
one of the most important things that you can think about is your footwear. So nothing spoils a good hike worse and faster than blisters. The best way to avoid blisters is to have really great shoes. So I like to walk in lightweight, low top hiking boots. Um, these, my hiking boots actually fit more like trail runners. They have good support, they have good soles. Um, they're not huge and clunky like you would think of in a hiking boot. Um, and I also like to walk in toe socks. So mine are called Ininji socks and it's where each toe has a separate little opening. They're like gloves for your toes and those really fight off blisters. I recommend that you start training in your hiking shoes at least two months before you leave because you really want them well broken in before you go. The other thing that you should really think about is a good backpack because you're going to spend a lot of time with that pack on your back. So what makes a good travel backpack for the trail? It's a few things. One, it's really comfy straps. It's a really great waist belt that helps distribute your weight and then also adequate water storage. So you want holsters or somewhere to put water bottles so that you can stay hydrated on trail. And something else that's really good to think about for the Camino especially is either a power bank for your phone, um, a power strip, or some device that um, allows you to not have to use the outlets quite as much because especially if you stay in an albergue, there's a lot of demand on the outlets like this photo shows. And so you'll be really happy if you don't have to charge your phone every night or if when you do charge your phone, you can also be charging something else through that same little outlet slot. So those are my big recommendations for packing and preparing. And Cassandra, I'm I'm a marathoner and I we say the same thing about shoes. It's like <laughs> the worst thing you can do is be like a couple days before the marathon. Oh, I should get these great new racing shoes. Oh, right. Like your entire foot is going to be a blister. Um, so I very much resonate with those recommendations. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving us some insight in, into how to pack for a big hiking trip. Let's now continue on with our virtual hike. Pamplona, the historic capital of the province of Navarra, with its imposing ramparts, is the first major city pilgrims encounter. Traditionally, they enter the city through this gate. So, uh, Cass, we're actually not going to stop in Pamplona today. If viewers, if you're interested in getting some, um, seeing the lively atmosphere of Pamplona, um, we've linked to the episode in which Rick explores Pamplona. But Cass, one thing that I do want to know from you is, is it common for people to take rest days? And when they do, is it typically in bigger cities so that you can restock on supplies or things? Yeah, so I definitely recommend doing rest days. You'll need it for your body, but also for your spirit, right? Um, you're generally not there to just walk every day and make it a death march. You really want to enjoy it. So I like to recommend taking a rest day about every four days if you're on a really long walk like this. And a bigger town is a great place for a rest day because you're going to have more services. You're going to be able to restock your snacks. You're going to be able to get your shoe fixed if you need to, send something home, um, but also do a little sightseeing because maybe there's something that you wouldn't see on trail, but you're really interested in. You could catch a bus, go for a day, go and see something and then come back. All right. Well, there's going to be no rest for us tonight. Ain't no rest for the wicked. We are continuing <laughs> on. After the commotion of Pamplona, getting back on the pilgrimage trail brings a welcoming peace. From here, the hills give way to Spain's vast high plain. A day's walk west of Pamplona, the town of Puente de la Riena, or the Queen's Bridge, retains a pilgrim's vibe. Its graceful bridge dates from the 11th century, and pilgrims have been crossing it ever since. Narrow main streets are typical of Camino towns. They were born as a collection of pilgrim services flanking the path, places to eat, sleep, heal, and pray. This 12th century church, with a stork's nest guarding its steeple, is thought to be founded by the Knights Templar who came to protect pilgrims along the route. Its stark Romanesque interior features a distinctive Y-shaped crucifix, 
likely carried all the way across Europe to this spot by pilgrims from Germany. I can imagine how six or seven hundred years ago, the weary faithful would sit right here, gaze up at their savior, and be inspired to carry on. So, Cassandra, I just love seeing, I love that footage of just walking through these small Spanish towns. I didn't do the Camino, but when I was in Spain, those were always my favorite places. It's just finding those, those little rural chapels and things. And I'm wondering, can you just, can you paint us, paint us a picture with words of what it's like to, what a typical day on the Camino is like, kind of the sensations and feelings of it? Sure. Well, I'll do one better. I'll paint you a picture with, <laughs> with pictures, <laughs> words and pictures. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so the days on the Camino follow a really nice, predictable rhythm. So every day you're going to wake up, you're going to start your day off right with a big breakfast. That's really important when you're walking. Interestingly enough, breakfast isn't huge in Spain. And so some places you will find a spread like in this photo. Um, and that's typically in hotels or inns or places like Airbnbs. Um, but if you're staying in an albergue, you're probably not going to see a spread like this. The good news is you can stop at a cafe or at a restaurant in town if you do want a bigger breakfast, but you really wanna fill your tummy before you leave. Um, the next part of your day is usually always going to be stopping and making sure that you know your route for the day, that you go over your walking directions, you know what to expect, you know, you know where water might be, things like that if it's hot out. And the people who run the albergues are a wonderful source of information. So are fellow pilgrims. Everybody seems to have a guidebook of some sort in their pack. And uh, so you can definitely cross-reference other people's things. And once you figure out what you're going to do for the day, then it's time to set out. And this is really the best, best part of your day because you start the day, the trail is fresh. You start seeing new things. You're going to spend the majority of your day on your feet. So this is really where you launch into the main event. Now you spend all day following the scallop shell, following the red arrows. Even though you've gone over your route earlier, you don't have to worry about staying on track most of the time. And that's because the Camino is really well signed. Even if you were to be confused about where to go, there are always people around to ask, whether it's a fellow pilgrim or someone in a local village. Um, it's a really well-signed place, so don't be worried about losing where you're going. One of my favorite things to do in mid-morning is to stop for a really nice coffee and take a little break at a cafe along the way, have maybe a little pastry. It's a really nice way to just take a little break and then just keep moving on. So like we're seeing in the video, you pass over ancient paths, ancient bridges, you go to ancient towns. The history is just incredible and it's all around you. You'll see all sorts of things that make you feel like you've gone back in time, like this traditional form of food storage here. And, you know, you look at it and you wonder, what the heck is that at first? And then, of course, you look up on your phone and you try to Google and see what it is. Um, but you'll find so many things that make you just feel like you are really on the other side of the world and back in time. Of course, you walk until it's time to stop. And whenever you feel like stopping, you do. You stop on the side of the trail, you take your shoes off, you let your feet breathe, you take some wine out of your bladder, sit down, you have a snack, you read a book. That's my favorite thing to do there is to find a really sunny spot and uh, pull out my book and read a little bit before I go on. It only gets better throughout the day because in the afternoon, you have the opportunity to stop at any number of bars and order a nice refreshing glass of beer. Along with that, um, usually you get free appetizers with every drink that you order. So you can have peanuts, you can have chips, you can have all sorts of things. One of our most interesting uh, pinchos that we were served was octopus and it was really good. So it's important to fill up at lunch or during your afternoon snack because dinner in Spain is served really late. And that's kind of tough if you're a walker. You don't want to be eating at 8 p.m., but that's when dinner usually is served. So I suggest that you fill up in the afternoon. Another really great part about stopping and having a snack or a beer is that you get to talk with your fellow pilgrims. And that's one of the very best things about the Camino is that you have all of these really interesting people from all over the world and you get to share stories, you get to make friends, um, maybe even people that you'll go back and do another Camino route with. So that's pretty special. When you get in, you get to set your pack down, but you don't get to rest quite yet because you have a few trail errands to take care of. The first thing is that you probably want to take a shower. 
because you're weary, you're tired, you're dirty. Um, so go take your shower, then do your laundry by hand, hang it up so it's dry by the next morning. This is where the merino wool really comes in handy because it'll dry overnight. And get all that stuff taken care of before dinner. That way, when it is 8 p.m. and you get to eat, you will be able to really enjoy it. You'll, you should also take care of your shoes. So if it's been a rainy day, I like to shove newspaper into my shoes and it soaks up all the moisture so that they're dry the next day. So very handy. When you finally do make it to dinner, um, get excited because you're going to be served some of the most amazing food that you've ever tasted. Uh, in Spain, it's really popular to have what's called pinchos, especially if you're in Galicia and pinchos are small plates. And if you're seen in an albergue, meals will typically be served family style. So it won't necessarily look like this. But if you go to a bar or a restaurant, this is what it will look like. And you can order 10 different things and share them with your hiking companions and get to try everything. You know, after dinner, most pilgrims want to relax a little bit um, and journal. This is such an epic trip. You're experiencing so many interesting things as you go. You really want to record it. So it's nice to grab your bottle of wine, sit down with your journal and just get everything out. And then of course, the best part is turning in early because you want a big night of sleep. Um, when do you ever get a really great big night of sleep, right? In your normal life, but on the Camino, you get one every night because you're tired in a good way. So you get your big long night of sleep, you wake up and you know what you have to look forward to? another day of amazingly the same thing. So it's pretty wonderful. Oh, that, it sounds fantastic, Cass. And again, I, I have to vouch for the putting the newspaper in your wet shoes. That is a, a good runner's trick as well. Um, so, and Cass, I mean, you talked about some of that food looked delicious. And I would imagine that one of the most important parts of your daily routine is the snacks that you take on the trail with you. Yes. What are your favorite hiking snacks? Well, so I have some right here to show you. <laughs> um, one of my very favorite things to take on trail is actually a baguette and some cheese. It's really easy. It won't spoil, it won't go bad during the day. Um, I also carry a pocket knife to be able to carve the cheese and put it on the baguette. And it's just a really local, easy thing to do. So you feel pretty fun in the morning going to the market and just grabbing your baguette, grabbing your cheese, maybe some sausage. And yeah, that's what I typically hike with. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we didn't have any pocket knives at the op pocket knives at the <laughs> office. So we're just using butter knives tonight. Um, but I also supplied Cass and I with my favorite trail snack. I grew up in a hiking family. Um, and in the Gunning family, the Gunning trail mix always was as heavy as possible on uh, the chocolate. So I got some trail mix that reflects that. Um, now that we're all nourished, let's continue onwards on our journey, Cass. A five-day walk, or two-hour drive for us, brings us to our next stop, Burgos. It's a pedestrian-friendly city straddling its river. Stately plane trees line the riverside promenade, giving shade through the hot days. Its main square seems designed to bring the community together. Today's Burgos feels workaday, but with a hint of gentility and former power. Like so many towns here in the north of Spain, it became important during the Reconquista, that centuries-long struggle to push the Muslim Moors back into northern Africa from where they came. Its position on the community Santiago and as a trading center helped it to flourish. For five centuries, Burgos was the capital of the Kingdom of Castile. It's dominated by an awe-inspiring Gothic cathedral designed by French architects in the 13th century, with its lacy spires added by German architects in the 14th. The ornate exterior is matched by its lavish and brightly lit interior. In Spain, the final flowering of the Gothic age was the elaborate, plateresque style. As was typical of Gothic churches, it's ringed by richly decorated chapels built over the centuries by and for wealthy parishioners. This chapel is dedicated to Saint Anne, the Virgin Mary's mother. Its 15th century altar features the Tree of Jesse. A sleepy and apparently very fertile Jesse slumbers at the bottom, sprouting a lineage that connects him to the Holy Child and Virgin. Mm -hmm. 
This sumptuous chapel marks the tomb of a regional governor and his wife under a brilliant star-shaped vault. It's striking for its gracefulness and femininity. Oh, Cass, that just, I, I actually, Burgos is one of my favorite cities in Spain and this cathedral is amazing. And I'm just wondering, do you feel like you experience some of these sites differently when you are a long distance hiker and you've gotten to these places over sometimes hundreds of miles on your own feet? Is it, do you experience them differently or does it feel more rewarding? It definitely feels more rewarding. And I think it does change the experience because you're not fresh. You're not, you know, in the mindset of visiting five different sites in a day and trying to check them all off your list. Instead, you come as you are, you're tired, you're processing things, you're looking forward at where you're going that evening. And I think it makes it a more real experience. And I think that you have more to think about when you're there and contemplate. And I think that, make, I think that makes a big difference. Hmm. And I would imagine that it's all the more so when we actually arrive at Santiago de Compostela. So let's continue onward in that journey. Inspirational as this cathedral is, the pilgrims have a long trek ahead of them. The slow pace and need for frequent rest breaks provide plenty of opportunity for reflection, religious and otherwise. For some, leaving behind a stone symbolizes unloading a personal burden. The first person to make this journey was St. James himself. After the death and resurrection of Christ, the apostles traveled far and wide to spread the Christian message. Supposedly, St. James went on a missionary trip from the Holy Land all the way to this remote corner of Northwest Spain. According to legend, in the year 813, St. James' remains were discovered in the town that would soon bear his name. People began walking there to pay homage to his relics. After a 12th century pope decreed that the pilgrimage could earn forgiveness for your sins, the popularity of the Camino de Santiago soared. The Camino also served a political purpose. It's no coincidence that the discovery of St. James' remains happened when Muslim Moors controlled most of Spain. The whole phenomenon of the Camino helped fuel the European passion to retake Spain and push the Moors back into Africa. But by about 1500, with the dawn of the Renaissance and the Reformation, interest in the Camino died almost completely. Then in the 1960s, a handful of priests reestablished the tradition. The route has since enjoyed a huge resurgence, with 100,000 pilgrims trekking to Santiago each year. Eight days further down the trail is Lyon, a sizable city with an enjoyable small town atmosphere. Founded as a Roman camp in the first century, Lyon gradually grew prosperous and was the capital of its own kingdom for centuries. Today's Lyon is the youthful leading city of one of Spain's biggest provinces. Its 13th century Gothic cathedral, towering dramatically over the town center, must have stoked the spirit of medieval Christians. Through the Middle Ages, the steady flow of pilgrims from all across Europe inevitably resulted in a rich exchange of knowledge, art, and architecture. That's one reason why today, all along the Camino, you find magnificent churches and exquisite art. Further along the Camino, the terrain changes. Pilgrims pass through rolling hills blanketed with vineyards. The path leads to the small town of Villafranca del Bierzo, where they reach the 12th century Church of St. James with its famous Gate of Forgiveness. The pilgrimage was an arduous trek, and not everyone succeeded. 500 years ago, thanks to a compassionate pope, it was decided that anyone who made it this far and got sick and couldn't complete the journey over the rugged last stretch to Santiago could stop here and call it a successful pilgrimage anyway. Next to the church is a classic Camino Albergue. This 80-bed hostel is run by volunteers and provides 10,000 pilgrims a year with nearly free beds. At regular intervals all along the route, humble hostels like this give trail-weary pilgrims a place to tend their needs, from nursing sore feet to doing laundry. <laughs> Volunteers cook and serve communal meals. A wonderful camaraderie percolates as a multinational community 
young and old and of all beliefs is created. So, Cass, I, I want to know your thoughts on these, these albergues, these hostels for pilgrims. Um, what were your experiences there like? Um, what did you like about them? What didn't you like about them? It seems like such a, such a unique um, type of place. It is. It's very unique. And the truth is that, you know, there are pros and cons with the albergues. So some of the pros, they're very cheap and affordable. So if you're a budget traveler, that's a good way to go. If you're a solo traveler or um, traveling in a group, also really great. Um, but there also there are also some cons. So, you know, they look very bare bones and that's because they are. So they're meant to make it so that anyone can walk the, the, pil the pilgrimage and so that it's not a financial concern or a strain on those who really want to do it, which is amazing. But there are also options if you don't want to have a bare bones experience like that. So um, there are also really wonderful hotels and inns and bed and breakfast that you can stay along the way. This is one of my favorites. I kind of mix it up. I did both. I did albergue so that I could really have that experience and, um, you know, have the group dinners with people and meet all the other pilgrims and have that community, which I think is a really important part of the pilgrimage. But then I also wanted to do private places where I could actually get a good night's sleep because I don't sleep well in dorms. Um, so this spot, you know, is really reflective of some of the places that are available along the Camino that are old world, they're set in nature, they're gorgeous, they're just very rustic, um, but also beautiful. And this can be a really good choice for couples, especially because you can actually share a bed. Um, and, you know, even if you are wanting to stay mainly in albergues, I suggest accommodations like this occasionally, you know, maybe once a week, kind of as a vacation within your pilgrimage as a way to actually get a good night's sleep and be able to treat me blisters like my husband is doing in this photo and um, to really just have a rest. It, it's a nice way to mix it up. So I think there's, there's definitely a lot of merit to doing both. Mm. I, I like that. I like that idea of oftentimes we get it in our head that you have to do it one way or the other. Um, and I, I like that idea of you, you can have it both ways. Right. Um, and this next segment, spoiler alert, I love, um, you know, we heard Rick talk about the history of the Camino and its religious roots, and it's really blossomed into this thing that people have really deep emotional reasons for doing. Um, and Rick took the time to interview some of these people, um, and we're going to hear from them now. The challenging journey encourages introspection, and each pilgrim has their own motivation. So why have you taken this journey? For me, I suppose it's, it's a bit kind of corny or cheesy, but um, to find things like a bit of balance again in life. You know, I spend a lot of time, my job, working in office and sales, it's stressful, it's money, money, money. So it's nice to get out on the open roads, live out of a rucksack, just forget about cars and computers and motorways. You know, I was going to be a bit tired and worn down by all of that. So for me, hopefully I take back kind of a, a feeling of um, regeneration, renaissance. You learn just to live with the silence of the nature around you. And you really feel sent into a world that most of the time does not exist in big towns like Berlin or New York or other towns because there's always something around you that, that distracts you. But when you are in villages like this here, yeah, and you only see the church and there's nobody on the street, it's really um, calming. I think that you feel uh, closer yeah. to God yeah. doing this uh, coming. You feel uh, closer to your own uh, soul because you, you have time to think about yourself, about your problems, about the things that you left at home. And you feel uh, closer to God, closer to your, to your own soul. So, Cast this uh, brings up the obvious question of why is it, I mean, do you think that it is important for people that are interested in doing the Camino that they do have some personal thing to work through, whether it's something religious, whether it's just some transition in their own life, um, some something philosophical? Do you think that that's an important aspect? And why did you choose to hike the Camino? 
Well, I have to say we share that as like the favorite part of the video. I love hearing why those people walked. And I don't think you have to have that. But honestly, I think that if you're Camino curious, you do have something like that in you that you want to explore. And I think that is a really great place to explore it. Um, so actually the reason that I did the Camino was a little different. Um, that was how Mac and I got married. So we used the pilgrimage as a way to contemplate the vows that we were going to make and to write our vows. And we kind of also left it up to fate. We said, you know, this sounds good, but if it doesn't really work or if it doesn't feel right, then we're not going to do it. But it did feel right. And then we ended up meeting um, a fellow pilgrim along the way, a British uh, railway engineer. And we really hit it off with him. And we asked him if he would marry us at the end. And so we did. We got married in front of about 400 strangers in a pop-up ceremony on the steps of the cathedral at the very end. So for us, the pilgrimage was really about marriage. And um, I love what the one hiker was saying in the video about you have so much time to think when you're walking. And it's true. So much time to think. It's wonderful. And so for us, with our love of European hiking, there really wasn't a better way to get married. And so um, a pilgrimage can be even, it doesn't have to be religious. It could be something like, you know, you're thinking about a transition in your life or, you know, you want to celebrate something or like this, you want to get married. So wait, Cass, did you hike the Camino with a wedding dress in your pack? No, it was much more <laughs> spontaneous than that. So we got into Santiago really late one evening and we had a flight to Paris midday the next day. And so all the shops were closed when we got into Santiago. So it was really the next morning we said goodbye to each other. We had two hours to get ourselves outfitted in clothes and shoes um, and to find a new family Bible and to find the flowers and all of that. And so we literally met on the stairs dressed up in our wedding stuff that we had just found in Santiago de Compostela and had a random person take our pictures for us. So, <laughs> well, I think that you need to contact the Guinness World Book of Records <laughs> and see if you can have the record for longest walk down the aisle. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> I really like that, Gabe. <laughs> I know. Well, look into it. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, it seems like a very unique reason to uh, to walk the trail. And we saw you on the steps of Santiago, the, the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela, and we are getting so close. Um, let's journey into Galicia, the province with Santiago now. The final leg of the journey leads through lush and green Galicia. And the gateway to Galicia is the rustic hamlet of Othebreo, perched high on a ridge. The town welcomes pilgrims with ancient and characteristic stone huts. The church, founded in the 9th century, is one of the oldest on the Camino route. Pilgrims are sure to stop in for another stamp on their Camino credential. Green and densely forested Galicia shatters visitors' preconceptions of Spain. Pilgrims pass ghostly castles, simple farmhouses with slate roofs, and sleepy medieval villages. Here it's easy to see the Celtic heritage Galicians share with their cousins just across the sea in Ireland. So Cass, um, I actually studied abroad in Asturias, which is just one province over from Galicia. And mm -hmm. it's so, it's very different than the rest of Spain. I mean, you hiked the English way, which is um, entirely in Galicia uh, before right. your wedding, as we just learned. Um, can you tell us a bit about what sets Galicia apart and makes it unique and what makes the English way unique? Sure. Yeah. So the English way is my favorite route on the Camino um, because it is in Galicia. It's beautiful, but it's also short enough to be accessible to people who want to fit it into other travel plans or, you know, who want to see if they really do like doing this kind of travel and want to test it out before doing you know, two months or five weeks. Um, so the English way is a great trail. It runs for 73 miles through Galicia. And in my book, I profile a five day journey on that. It can either be five or six days, depending on where you start. But the route starts in either A Coruña or Ferrol. And those towns were the ones I talked about earlier where British pilgrims would take their ships to, they'd get off their ships there and they would walk the rest of the way to the cathedral in Santiago de Compostela. Um, now, if you can, 
if you can plan your journey to leave during Semana Santa, which is the week leading up to Easter, I highly recommend it. That is when we kicked off our English way as we were preparing to get married. And it really couldn't have been more perfect. I mean, talk about a cultural hiking adventure. Each day there are these parades and they run late into the night. And they're all about um, the celebration of Easter and, you know, thinking about all of that. And I mean, they're not just little parades. These are parades that are huge. They wind through the city. They're broadcast on TV even. Like you'll see newscasters on the side of the road um, narrating the parades. And, and Cassandra, if you could actually just quickly go back to that previous slide. Sure. Um, I always just like to mention, I studied um, in, in uh, sorry, the next slide. Oh, um, this one? Yeah, for those of that did not tune in to our um, Andalusia with Concepcion Delgado episode, we learned about these outfits, which if you're not familiar with Spanish culture can be a bit jarring at first for us totally. Americans. Um, this is something that very much predates even the United States and is um, traditional garb worn by the Catholic Brotherhoods during Semana Santa as they parade through the streets. So um, I know that a lot of us Monday Night Travelers learned about that a few months ago, um, but just for any that were curious, um, this is a, a traditional uh, Spanish vestments of the Catholic Brotherhood. Yeah. So it definitely is a little shocking when you first see it until you learn the, the meaning behind it. Um, I think one of the most impressive things about these big parades are the very ornate and the very heavy floats and the different things that they're carrying. And these people who are carrying the floats, they're hooded as you've seen, but also the most hardcore of them are barefoot, walking miles and miles through the city um, and you can tell how painful it must be, and you can just see the exertion that it takes um, to make these floats go forward. They kind of wiggle and wiggle and wiggle and then step forward. And so it's really almost an act of penance as well as, well as an act of worship. And it's just a really a must see, and it's quite the thing to kick off your pilgrimage if you can make it then. Um, so the English way winds through Galicia, as we talked about, which is really beautiful. So we're talking bucolic farmland, rolling hills, lots of baby animals. Um, when we were hiking, it was a lot of baby sheep that had just been born. And you also get a lot of the stunning architecture that you see elsewhere on the Camino. And all of that combined means that for a bite-sized um, chunk of the Camino, you really can't beat the English way. It really is the perfect starter Camino, I would say. All right. Well, I mean, you you have me sold on it, um, and it's much easier easier to schedule than five weeks. Um, <laughs> and I we're so close to the cathedral to Santiago de Compostela that I feel like I can smell it. So uh, let's get there now. After over a month on the trail, spirits are high as well worn pilgrims reach their final stop, the city of Santiago de Compostela. Santiago has long had a powerful and mysterious draw on travelers. This neat and sturdy city is built of granite. Its arcaded streets are a reminder that winters here are cold and wet. Strolling across its squares and under its grand churches, you can imagine a time when the city was a religious and cultural powerhouse. Santiago's heyday was the 12th century when the notion of Europe was still in its infancy. It was a place where people from all corners came together, shared ideas, and then dispersed. In some ways, the very idea of Europe as a civilization gelled during this age, and Santiago played an important role. People here have their own distinct language, Galego. It's a mix of Spanish and Portuguese. Galicia's ancient Celtic roots are particularly evident in its music. With wailing pipes and thundering drums, the Celtic heritage announces itself loud and clear. But nothing can distract the pilgrims as they take the final steps of their long journey. Around the last corner, they reach the destination of a thousand years of pilgrims, the cathedral that holds the tomb of St. James. As millions of weary yet exhilarated pilgrims have done before them, they stand before the cathedral and are filled with jubilation.
but the religious climax for many lies within the cathedral. Imagine you're a medieval pilgrim. You've just walked 500 miles. Your journey is done. Worshiping before the altar, you give thanks to St. James for a safe passage, and you reflect on the lessons of your journey. And if you're here on a festival day, the mass culminates with an enormous swinging incense burner. Gazing at the spectacle of this 120-pound burner flying through the air, you're awestruck by the wonder of God. Finally, you climb the stony staircase behind the altar to the statue of St. James, studded with precious gems. Embracing him from behind, you take a moment to celebrate your spiritual or personal triumph. So, Cassandra, I, I would love to know, after hiking so many miles, what did it feel like to see the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela? What were your emotions and what were you feeling as that journey culminated? It's amazing. I mean, you almost don't want the journey to be over. You know, you're a little tired, um, but it's still, it's, you know, you've loved your Camino so much and here it kind of ends. So I think it's a little bittersweet, actually. Um, it is a rite of passage when you go there to do the Pilgrim's Mass, to take part in that. And I think that was my favorite part. It wasn't even being at the cathedral necessarily, it was being surrounded by so many people and knowing what all of them had been through because you had just done the same thing. And so regardless of where they were from, how they were dressed, you know, anything, you had that really big thing in common with them. And just seeing everybody else who was dirty and exultant and just weary, but weary in a really good way, uh, I think that for me was the most powerful part. Um, it's, it really is the kind of experience, especially, you know, to have such a big end to the journey that makes you want to go back and do more. So I know um, one, actually the guy who married us, he goes back every couple of years and re-hikes the Camino doing a different route. And I think it, it, it's a testament to the power of the Camino that it really does encourage people and make people want to go back and do it over and over again, not necessarily on the same path, but on a different route, ending up at the same spot. So um, it's my goal to convince my husband, Mac, to go back and celebrate our anniversary there by doing another Camino at some point. And my goal is also to take my girls there when they graduate high school. I have two little girls and to do Caminos with them. So, um, but you know, whatever it is that you think makes you want to do the Camino, I would highly encourage you to do it. So don't wait, go do it. Life is short, time is, time is a waste in. Um, it doesn't have to be about religion. It doesn't have to necessarily even be a pilgrimage, but whatever you want it to be. I think the Camino is one of those trails that really has the power to change your life. Part of that is, being surrounded by so many like-minded people, but a part of it also, I think, is um, the nature of walking for so long and having so much time to think. So I like to tell people, you never know how the Camino is going to change your life. It will change your life. You just don't know how until you go and do it. Well, Cassandra, I actually uh, thank you, first of all, for taking us all the way to Santiago de Compostela, but um, I want to finish back on Mont Blanc because as you talk about some of these takeaway lessons, um, there are some really beautiful things that you say in that episode. And I would like to finish um, by sharing those with everybody now. So um, let's, let's listen to what Cassandra has to say on the slopes of Mont Blanc. As we head out on what'll be my last day on the trail, I realize that after so many decades, I'm enjoying a brand new European experience, an experience I wouldn't have found without a great guide like Cassandra. Cass, what are the most important things people should know when they're hiking like this? You know, there are only really three big things that you need to think about. The first one is be prepared for time in the outdoors. So at a minimum, you need good shoes, some great layers, a solid backpack, and a good map. Number two is be really proactive about your comfort when you're on trail. So eat before you're hungry, 
drink before you're thirsty, and the moment that anything feels uncomfortable, if it's your backpack or your shoes, just stop and take care of it before you go on. And finally. Don't be intimidated by all of the gear or the athletic nature of walking. You don't need to be a hiker. You don't need to be a super athlete to enjoy this kind of travel. Because look at my gear and look at what shape I'm in and I'm having a blast. Right, it's not about exercise. This kind of thing is best when you slow down. So there's a hut around every corner. Stop and take a coffee. Or in the afternoon, have a victory beer if you had a big climb. When you find a stream, soak your feet. That's really how you enjoy this. It's like you're on vacation. It should be fun. Cass, I love those final thoughts about not being intimidated by these hiking trails. And I'm, I'm just wondering, what do you think, especially for us fast-paced Americans, what do you think are the best lessons that we can take away from not just the Camino, but um, hiking vacations in general? And how can we incorporate those back into our daily lives? Well, I think, you know, we've become so busy, so overscheduled, so overstimulated. I think walking-based travel can really help you slow down. I mean, you could really only put one foot in front of the other and you just keep doing that all day. And you have so much time to think. And I mean, how often in our daily lives do we just do, do, do? And we don't stop to think. We don't have that luxury of what feels like a luxury. So I think doing a Camino and dedicating yourself to something that's really a long walk, especially can help you not just travel a little slower, but actually live life a little slower. And I think that's definitely something that you can bring back into your life here. Well, thank you again for being our guide on the Camino tonight. Um, I know that we have a lot of great questions for you, but as always, quickly before we get to those, we have a word from our sponsor. And as always, that sponsor is Rick Steves Europe. Um, if you are thinking about doing a trip to Spain, maybe um, as a compliment to a little trip on the Camino, uh, consider a Rick Steves Europe tour. Uh, we have tours that go to many of the de destinations along the Camino. Um, and additionally, if you want to travel in Spain on your own, we have our Rick Steves Europe Spain guidebook. It's actually on sale this week, um, coincidentally. Um, so feel free to check that out. We also have a nice chapter on the Camino and some destinations along it as well. Um, now, Cass, the first question that we have is one that we often get. People get excited about traveling to whatever destination we cover on Monday Night Travel, and they want to know, when should I go? So that is what Stephen is wondering tonight. What is the best time of year to hike the Camino, in your opinion? So I think the shoulder seasons, meaning like spring or really early fall can be amazing because you have better deals on flights. You have not so many people um, and generally they're not too rainy. Uh, so I would say you can avoid a lot of the really packed albergues by going a little bit in the shoulder season that way. Um, that said, it really depends on what route you're walking because especially if you're doing the French way, and you're going over the Pyrenees, you need to be really careful about when the Pyrenees are going to have snow. And so you want to look at that to really judge because the higher mountains are going to have snow often into the early summer. Um, well, speaking of safety, we also have um, Amber who is wondering, um, is it safe for females, uh, solo female travelers to, to do the Camino or I, I suppose to do really any long distance hiking trail in Europe? So I do a ton of hiking, um, also by myself, and I always feel safer on trail in Europe than I do back in Seattle, which is kind of amazing. Um, so part of that is that, you know, you're really well connected there. The trails go through more towns, and so you feel a little bit less alone. You're not in the middle of the forest by yourself for hours at a time, kind of like if you're going on a long trail in the U.S., um, another thing that's really nice about a trail like the Camino that can feel especially good for a solo traveler, especially a woman, is that you get a hiking bubble. So the because the trail kind of starts and ends at um, stages, you know, you'll stay in an albergue or in a town with people and you'll generally see those people the next evening and the next evening and the next evening. So that's great when you do want company because then, you know, you can talk to people on the trail and these are people who will kind of get to know you and they'll know your story. It's company when you want it. 
you don't have to have company if you don't want it, but then those are also people who check in on you and you check in on them. So they kind of become your Camino family that way. So I feel really confident as a solo female traveler doing the Camino, especially. And um, in regards to the people around you on the trail, um, Carlos is wondering, do you see a lot of Spaniards also doing the trail or is it mostly something that foreigners come in to do? You see some Spaniards on trail, um, not very many in my experience. You see a lot of Europeans though, other Europeans, um, and you see a lot of people from other places in the world. I think um, it's like when you have something really famous in your own backyard, you're not so motivated to go and see it, right? Because it just seems normal. But if it's somewhere else, then you really got to check it out. So I think that's part of what happens on the Camino. It's why I live um, like 400 meters from the Space Needle and still have never gone up the Space Needle. Um, right. And did you find that on the trail, um, quite a few people spoke English? Yeah, so English is very common, especially because, you know, after the popularity of the movie The Way, especially there have been so many Americans and Canadians going to do the Camino. Um, in some of the spots, it's a little more difficult, but you know, you have to remember that the Camino is kind of, I mean, it attracts a lot of people. And so the places that are along the Camino are going to be able to support English speaking tourism. And if the person, if the accommodations that you're staying at doesn't speak English, then generally there's someone nearby who can translate for you. So I would say it's highly accessible for people who only speak English. We have a few questions about logistics on the trail, um, Cass. Kenneth is wondering, are there a lot of good places to fill up on water along, or in your case, I suppose, fill up on wine along the trail? <laughs> yes, both. Um, so, you know, you can generally fill up your water when you leave your accommodations, and then you'll find little springs along the way or little water spigots where you can fill up your water. You can also go into cafes and get water there. So water is pretty easily accessible along the path. And then following that, logical conclusion of consuming that water. Um, we have some people, uh, Scott included, wondering, what do you do about bathrooms along the way? Are there enough bathroom stops or do you need to be prepared for a, a more rustic pit stop? Right, it can be a mix. So it depends on where exactly you're walking, but oftentimes you can find enough cafes along the way or restaurants to be able to go in, have a coffee, and as they like to say, take care of the last coffee that you had. And so you're kind of stopping to buy something while using the bathroom as you go. In some spots you may be, um, you know, having to use the bathroom outside, but that's not the norm by any means. And are, is it also pretty common to find laundry facilities along the way? Susan is, is curious about that. Yeah, so you can hire a laundry service from your accommodation sometimes, not necessarily albergues because they're pretty bare bones and bare staffed, but um, from private accommodations. But in my experience, it's so much easier just to carry along a little travel soap and just suds yourself, uh, your stuff up in the sink and then just hang it to dry. It's not really worth the extra expense or the time of being away from that laundry. So I suggest doing your own laundry. Um, and we have Charlie who is wondering, how much should people budget for the Camino? I, I'm assuming it's going to be a bit different if you want to go the albergue hostel route, um, or if you want to go the kind of bed and breakfast route. Um, but what's kind of your rule of thumb for, for budgeting for one of these trips? Right. Well, to start your budget, I would first, you know, you're going to need to look at how many days you're going to be gone. I like to pencil in where about I want to stop. And then I keep a spreadsheet with all my accommodation costs because some of those will be charged in advance. Some you'll need to pay in cash when you arrive. So one tip for the Camino is to carry lots of cash with you because a lot of places are cash only. Um, but for an albergue, you know, it could be $10 a night. They're pretty affordable. For private accommodations, probably something more along the lines of 50 to $70 a night. And because your main activity all day is walking, you don't have a lot of costs beyond accommodations and food. Food, you know, you're generally around $25 a day. So that's kind of a good starting point when thinking about your Camino. And when you're thinking about where you're gonna stay, um, 
do you have to reserve accommodations in advance or can you just show up day of? You know, it really depends. So if you're going to stay in private accommodations, I suggest booking those in advance because those can book up. Albergues can also book up, uh, especially in the busy season. The trick for that is that you want to leave early from your original accommodations to be able to get a bed. Or a lot of times you can call the next albergue and reserve a bed for yourself. Um, and to get that information, you can refer to a good Camino guidebook for the route that you're chosen. And Cass, we have time for one more question tonight. Um, this question comes from Stephanie, who is nine years old, maybe a future pilgrim. Um, and Stephanie wants to know, beyond the Camino, so you've, you've shared your love of the Camino with us tonight, um, but beyond that, what would be your favorite European hiking trail or, or the one that you're most excited to hike again? Well, my true love trail, the one that made me really fall in love with long distance hiking in Europe is the Alpine Pass route in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And it crosses Switzerland from east to west and it goes across all of these incredible mountain passes and it doesn't get any more scenic than that trail. I mean, that's just, that's a lifetime must do. I mean, I was on our best of Switzerland tour and let me tell you that is a country I would spend time walking across. It, it is gorgeous. Um, well, Cass, thank you so much for taking the time to not just journey across the Camino with us, but to help us prepare for any sort of walk that we do and, and rethink philosophic, philosophically the ways that we can approach travel and that there are maybe different ways to travel than, than we knew. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time out of your night to travel with us. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Happy hiking, everyone. Happy hiking to you on all your future pilgrimages as well. And thank you all of you for joining us. Um, I want to remind you that next week, uh, Julianne Worden is going to be joined by Dave Herline and Yana Clausen, the original Rick Steves Europe Scandinavia guides, and we're going to explore Denmark beyond Copenhagen. Um, so we hope that you'll join us for that. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we wish you a good night, and we hope to see you next Monday. Good night, Cass. Good night, Gabe. Good night, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.